The next stage in your development is to say, I'm going to do a beautiful turn entry into the middle of the thermal, and I'm going to get so good at this that I can do that whilst I'm looking back over my shoulder. Yeah. And then, with a bit of luck, you won't <coughs> bump into anybody. Yeah. Somebody might bump into you, but you won't bump into somebody else. Yeah. And believe me, that's a serious issue. Right. He's not being bumped into. Yeah. Yeah, because that's one of the things that frightens me most with that ride, is somebody bumping into. Where are we going? Um, so, there's a couple of things. The, uh, age and encouraging youngsters. Yeah. Okay. And maybe you want, might want to say something about why these young lads should definitely do the junior nationals. Lots <laughs> 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 of beer and alcohol. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> John Hay asked something about coaching and uh, the cross-country coaching, how the best way for us coaches to coach peoples. Yeah, this very briefly, this problem of young people. Uh, we win out many young people in our sport. Uh, it's a problem for us. Yeah? Uh, we have shallow at 14 now. Why the hell are they all? Yeah? Why aren't we keeping them? Why aren't we sending them solo? Well, there, there's a lot of practical reasons. There's some baggage there. There's issues about money and stuff. But actually, if you were a 14, 15 year old and you walked onto this airfield a week and you looked around, you think, nah, I'm not going to do something else. It's just a crap environment for young people. Yeah. And, and, and until we admit that, we're screwed. Yeah? <laughs> until the club committees admit that and the CFIs admit that, we might as well not bother doing anything else. I've been battling all my life to get people to grow up to the fact. I started Salt with Lightning Club. 1969, yeah. Beatles were still having hits. Yeah. <laughs> we found an airfield, started the gliding club. It was too far to travel, and got some mates, and we started the gliding club. And we set out with the objective that when you join the club, you join for Silver City. And we were very successful, which is why I ended up working for the BGA, because we were so successful within the club that they started to take an interest. And the development officer then came down and said, oh, yeah, come on, come on. It just so happened I was fed up with my job, and you know, you know how it goes. But, What's interesting about that is I went back to the club at its 25th, 25th uh, anniversary, I think it was, and they invited me back, because yeah, it's still going, which is great. And I had to say to them, the same I say to, I said to people in the BJ, and I say to you, when we started that gliding club, there was no internet. <laughs> there were no mobile phones. People lived differently, the culture was different. Yeah? People, their expectations were different. Yes. The world had changed. But tell you what, that gliding club was exactly the same. Yeah. It was exactly the same as walking into that club in 1971 or something, yeah. which is 35, yeah. 40 years ago. Yeah. I'll bet you, if, when the sun comes up, if I came here in the daylight, I haven't been to South Down for 20 years, came here with a fault when I worked for the BGA 25 years ago, I bet you it's the same. And the gliders are fancier, yeah. <laughs> and they're more expensive, yeah. But we have kestrels then and live out. And that's our problem. Our problem is that the sport is run by old people for old people in a way in which they're used to, yeah. And we haven't found a better way of doing it. I'm not telling you what the better way is, I don't know. Yeah? But we haven't found a better way. Yeah. So getting people, young people, into the sport and keeping them is very difficult because we're not bringing them into an environment they feel very comfortable with. Yeah? And Maybe the good thing is that all those old farts will die off yeah, and leave a big vacuum and they'll come and fill it because there are a lot of clever young people about, but I don't know. Maybe in the meantime we lose that critical mass that we need and all the clubs can't support their assets because they don't have enough income and they just disappear. So if you want the depressing scenario, 20 years time there's only 10 gliding clubs in the UK. That's the way I see it. So what do we do? We, what do we, we, we try. There's another um, problem that we have in our gliding organisation, and that is we've made too many rules. We have far too many rules. <laughs> and, and we've made life very difficult for ourselves. <laughs> we've made what is an easy, comfortable, safe sport into something really complicated. <clears throat> And health and safety has got nothing on what happens in gliding clubs. Yeah? Every time you do anything, there's a bloody rule for it somewhere. Even if people come on the airfield, they're told they can't park there, you've got to go over there. And, you, and it's the, an environmental thing. We've done that because we've never really understood the interface between professional and commercial aviation and recreational aviation. 
Now, if you look at other aviation sports, like, for example, paragliding or hang gliding, you know, micro, uh, micro lighting, not so much, because in UK, micro lighting doesn't work, but in other countries it does. Mm. Paramotors. Yeah? And they didn't have the baggage of commercial aviation. Yeah? They started from nothing without... Gliding was started by <coughs> power pilots, basically. It started with RAF people, with civil aviation people, with people who understood about flight. And it's always continued along that theme. So constantly we've suffered from trying to apply a commercial aviation philosophy to a recreation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the people who stayed in the sport are people who put up with that. And the people who wouldn't put up with that are either like me, they've been rebels all their lives and they've tried to change it, or they've left. And I've watched a lot of good people in the sport, really good people, just had just, just enough. Anymore, yeah. And you've all seen them come and go. So we, we, I don't think there's a lot we can do about this yeah, because it's just got so much inertia and it's going to take too long. But what we can at least do is recognise the problem yeah, mm -hmm. and, and hope that we can generate an atmosphere for the next generation to fix it. Mm -hmm. It's so bad that I said two young lads there last year, two friends came out, 14 year olds, and uh, their, their fathers, well, one of their fathers is a Red Bull champion. World champion, but the other one is a, just not gliding mate of mine. And I said, We were chatting one night, I said, Well, they should go so they should go gliding for Christ's sake. Yeah? Oh, well, you know, well, you know what it's like, you go down the club. Anyway, I said, Look, you send them out for a week, we'll go so. So they came out, we did eight flights, admittedly, each one was an hour, but we did eight flights, yeah, and sent them both seven. And they both flew for an hour on their first flights, and they both flew for an hour on their second flights. Yeah? And I said to them, For Christ's sake, don't go to any club in UK and tell them you've got solo in eight flights. He's going to put you right back at the beginning and they'll refuse to believe you know, you know and put, certainly don't tell him you flew with me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and isn't it a sad indictment? It's, it's a really sad indictment on our sport that we don't like progress, we don't like excellence because we think there must be a reason why we can't do this. It can't possibly be said. How many people went solo with the ATC? The old guys? How many launches? Sixteen. <laughs> 16, yeah, I went less than 16 months. We're still here, aren't we? <coughs> Can I stay? 27, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 was at, it was at Hendon, and there were only 800. Yeah, not many people were known up to it. I was told solo <laughs> after 12 winch launches, but the instructor told me, I can't possibly send you solo. It's not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the times have changed. Now, it's... Somebody young comes on to you and go gliding, and it's tough. It's really tough for them. And so we shouldn't expect them to should we? We shouldn't expect them to stay when we make it difficult for them to stay. <coughs> so that's the answer to the question. I don't know what the answer is. I just know I've got an idea about all the problems. Having, if you get one, though, if you do get one, some youngsters, you've really got to encourage them. Not too much. They've got to do something for themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to encourage them. We have, I've been to training juniors in the team for years now, and we had a period of really motivated juniors, really good guys, who were really strongly motivated and did a good job, and, and they, they went on well, and we won some medals with them, and they're still gliding and flying nationals and stuff. Then we had a period where the juniors we had weren't so motivated, and you could tell. They sort of thought that if they joined the coaching scheme and if they became junior team, by some miracle they'd become glider pilots. And you say, well, actually, it doesn't work like that. You've got to do some work yeah, if you want to become a glider pilot. And we've got a new bunch of juniors who are pretty good. Yeah? I did the training for this lot. We went to Australia last year and the year before. And they seem to have understood. They seem to have got it, <laughs> yeah, which is great. Sense. And we, there is so much um, potential once people start to get it. In there's so much coaching available. There's training available. Junior Nationals is a fantastic environment. It's a little bit cliquey, okay, but so's life, you know, you've got to, you've just got to find your way, haven't you? And you've got to mm -hmm. ignore all the dross and pick out the good bits. That was young people done. And the next question? <laughs> <laughs> coaching, how can we, how can we, any tips on the coaching, how our coaching system should be run, how coaches can help people? Yeah, well, I, I, talking to Paul, you have a coaching system, which is great, it's absolutely fantastic to have that. I had a little presentation, which we, part of the presentation made at BGA some years ago about coaching, because some people are confused between coaching and instructing. Uh, and it's important to understand the difference. Uh, and, and I can't show, there's some slides which showed it, but 
basically instructing is teaching people things they don't know. So instructors are there to teach people stuff that they don't know. Yeah. And coaches are there to help people do what they already know much better yeah, and yes. to continue to develop. Coaches do not have to be instructors and instructors often don't make very good coaches. Yeah. And that's, that's the, the nutshell of it. Yeah. There is a serious division between the two. Coaches can be people who just have a little bit more experience, a little bit of talent, maybe a little bit of a different idea, who can help people develop, work out what they need to do, come up with a program, give them some ideas, help them along their way. Instructors teach people to fly. Yeah? So I don't know how it works here, but um, the coaches are best, the best people to be coaches are people who are motivated to do it yeah? and doing it. And the best people to be instructors are people who are instructors. Yeah? They're not all great instructors, but they're the best people to be instructors. So if you've got a coaching scheme, you develop it along those lines where you pair people up, yeah. a couple of guys to a coach, or even one to one if you can, yeah. and you just help each other along. And if you're a really, really good coach, after a little while, your students are beating you. <laughs> if you're really good at it, not, it's not long before you can't keep up with them, and then you know you're doing a good job. <laughs> Other than that, I don't have a lot that I can add to your coaching scheme here, I'm afraid. Uh, so, any other last questions, or any other things that the burning ones I need to cover before I run out of the <coughs> breath? I, I hope I haven't given uh, too uh, a negative a picture about the way things are, because I think things are great, yeah? but they could be a lot better. <laughs> and I'm a great believer that you, know, you never stand still. Yeah? You should never stand still. You should always move on. There's always new horizons. There's always new things to do. Yeah? Even all you old guys sitting there with your grey hair, there's another adventure in you yet, you know. Yeah? There's another great adventure in you yet. And, Coming up and just find your glider now and again is a jolly nice thing to do. Yeah? But there's some real fun to be had out there. Mm. Some really good fun. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. And it is, uh, it's probably as important to gliding in UK now that the oldies in it start having more fun than we worry so much about the young people. Because that's if we can motivate them to do a lot more, yeah, then maybe that will drag some stuff up at the bottom. Well, I'm so, going to ask a question from the floor. Of course. Yes, sir. Um, it is a big tomorrow is a big worry in gliding, i.e., the youth. 